Kelly Baker. I'm in the environmental section at NDOT, and I'm the environmental project manager on this project. And Jason Jurgens is part of my team over there. He's the environmental section manager. And Ron Poe will be speaking after me to go over some more information. Um, as Steve was saying, for the project, um, basically it's our standard project. And most of our commitments are actually the same as any other DOT project. Um, I do want to highlight a couple, couple items that are specific to this project. <coughs> First of all, recreational resources. A wilderness park is in the area, and we have commitments in the contract that specify no tree removal, um, both within wilderness park and within 150 feet of the park. And then we've committed that to that access and parking will be maintained at wilderness park. And so let's say you talk to wilderness park folks and they say, oh yeah, you can put some material over here. Based off the contract, we are not allowed to do that. So make sure there's no staging, storing, um, stockpiling any of that within Wilderness Park because that would be a violation of the contract and our commitment to the public um, in the park. Uh, Jamaica North Trail, as Steve alluded to earlier, um, we do make sure that this park or the trail remains open at all times. And there's the exception of occasional nighttime closures for overhead construction as specified in the contract. Um, there are a couple of caveats to that um, as far as being able to maintain pedestrian and bicycle traffic. Um, the three items listed below. To maintain that traffic, uh, you can use flaggers, and then that's also called out in the contract about how that would be implemented. Um, specifically, we would need to have flaggers when construction equipment um, operates on or adjacent to the trail. Um, protective construction measures are also an option. Uh, this would include shoring, fencing, or temporary trail covers. And then there's also the option for a temporary detour, and that would be immediately adjacent to the existing trail. And then that's called out on the plans also about how that would be uh, need to be done. Our uh, permit through the Corps we don't have yet, so this will require an individual 404 permit. Um, currently, we're anticipating having this from the Corps beginning of November. And then once we have that, an addendum would be issued to include the special provisions and conditions and requirements uh, required by the Corps. For the wetland mitigation site that's going to be uh, constructed, since we don't have the 404 permit yet, we can't, we can't tell you exactly what the Corps is going to require, but based off previous experience for individual permits and mitigation sites, the construction of the site will need to be built concurrent with fill activities. In this case, fill activities would um, mean fill activities of wetlands and or waters of the U.S. Uh, material source sites. I want to put an emphasis on this because it's an individual permit, it will require a core review for any of the sites. Um, so we want to recommend submitting your site request as soon as possible to DOT so we can start a review and get those sent to the core. Um, I would also recommend if you know you have five possible different sites, if you can group those into one, one submittal, we will get those to the core as one submittal. Basically, if you submit something to us in December, we have five requests it would be one permit amendment versus if you said December, January, February, however, each one of those could become different permit amendments and would take time to coordinate through the core. Um, and if you have questions on those, definitely feel free to ask the environmental office. Um, and then uh, we would recommend any of the source sites be done in upland sites as opposed to wetlands. All right, threatened and endangered species, we have some commitments specific to those. Um, lighting, um, so for any nighttime work, we need to make sure that the light is focused on the work area and shielded to prevent light spill and light pollution. And then also for June 1st to July 31st, because we have northern long-eared bat, suitable habitat um, in the area, specific to those areas, we need to direct temp lighting away from those that habitat as, as much as practical. Um, Platte River depletions, this is an area of Platte River depletion concerns, so we need to be aware of that. Um, so for any source sites that we have after construction, just make sure that they're graded to drain water and not to pool water. Um, migratory bird responsibility is on the contractor for this project, and there is a provision that goes into more detail about that. Um, we do have the tree topping contract that um, will hopefully address most of those issues. However, um, after construction started, we still need to be aware of that a bird might want to nest on a pier or other structure. So just throughout the duration of the, con of the construction, we need to be aware of our migratory bird responsibilities. 
All right, and this project also has noxious weed survey requirement. And the county weed authority has um, either gone out this fall or will be going out. The district has coordinated that survey and they're gonna be identifying any areas of concern. And then if they have any areas identified, um, they will be treated prior to construction. So we would anticipate that being done next spring. And then those areas would need to be cleared and then any excavated material would be hauled off site and then disposed of. And then borrow sites, if needed, also need to be verified that they're uh, noxious and weed free per, um, per the county weed authority. All right, and just a little bit about hazmat. Um, so any excess waste soils generated from the locations shown up there would have to be disposed per regulation. So Major Oil, uh, Shoemakers, and Phillips 66, just areas to be aware of. And then there was one waste lagoon identified <coughs> along the project, and that area, or that site is also called out on the plans. So that will need to be properly abandoned per regulations. Um, and then any unexpected waste, which it, it might happen on this project, so we just wanted to call attention to that. Um, you just need to utilize the DOT unexpected, unexpected waste action plan. That's it for my portion. I'm going to hand it over to Ron. Okay, um, this project is going to be um, it is within our the jurisdiction of our MS4 permit, which is Mississippi Storm Sewer System, since it is based in the city of Lincoln. Um, what that means for construction essentially is that we have to follow our general construction stormwater permit, and we're also required to build post construction water quality BMPs on the project. Everything, all of our water quality BMPs are identified in the contract as either documented ditches, um, basins, and filter strips. So we're really not building anything unusual with our water quality items, but we do have to build the items that are in the contract in those locations. Um, the project will, um, basically for any um, plan revisions and change orders that happen on the project, um, they will have to go through an environmental review process um, that, that review process is done, it starts in the district and then can up, end up in the environmental section. Um, the main thing to remember with that is to be aware that, um, that um, change orders can require a um, change to our NEPA document and then to that, or it may require, and Federal Highway will be doing approval if it comes to our office and then the change orders. And also if we're doing change orders that are um, within waterways, um, and then potentially we could be needing a Corps core of Engineers permit, and, and, and all that stuff can take a little extra time in order to get those change orders approved. Um, moving on to construction stormwater, um, now within our region of EPA, um, there has been history of UK penalties within all four states of Region 7. Kansas, Missouri, and Iowa have all had their share of DOT. EPA penalties. Um, in Nebraska, we've had we just finished a consent order with EPA for our MS4 program, and we've also had construction stormwater visits from, from EPA as well as our local regulatory agencies. Um, with this being as high profile project as it is, we do anticipate that we will be visited by our regulatory friends, um, specifically um, Department of Environment and Energy here in Nebraska. I would highly anticipate them, them visiting. As well as there's high probability of EPA stopping by and visiting the project as well. So making sure all of our erosion control measures are kept up to date is highly important on this project. <coughs> um, the good thing about this project is that the, the state's general construction stormwater permit will be will apply to it. Um, so it's the same rules that we have we follow for 99% of our projects. Our, the stormwater permit is available to review <coughs> on NDOT's website or NDEE's website. Um, and a few slides, um, just to kind of give you a briefing of what, what's entailed. Um, the project will have a construction stormwater, uh, a stormwater pollution prevention plan tied to it. Um, <coughs> that plan for Nebraska DOT um, is basically a means of documenting all of our environmental commitments and what we're doing on the project. Um, we don't spend, it's not, not included within the contract for the project as there's all the, there's nothing in there that's going to be contractual. Um, if it, all the contractual stuff will be in the contract and specifications and other, and other locations. This whip is basically just a means for us to document our compliance with the permit. Um, the 
project will require a temporary erosion control plan, and that will need to be updated throughout the life of the project, the same as any other project that we do. This project is a little larger than everything we typically do. Um, the permit will require that we do inspections for environmental commitments every 14 days and after every half inch rain event. And I have that a minimum on that. And uh, our, our project staff will be doing, doing these bi weekly inspections. Um, however, we do have QA, QC procedures for the district environmental coordinator, my office, and potentially third party consultants can also be doing inspections as well for the project. Um, our specs now require that a contractor's rep, is, environmental rep, is available to um, attend all of the, all those scheduled bi-weekly inspections as well. So I encourage you to read the new environmental specifications that will be and that everything that included the project. And as I mentioned before, temporary erosion control plan will be updated throughout the life of the project to maintain on the project site, documenting all the DMPs that we're using throughout the construction process. Um, the, the permit requires what we call a 14-day rule, and that will be in effect on the project. And what the 14-day rule is that whenever we stop work on a portion of the project for more than 14 days, we need to be temporarily or permanently stabilizing that portion of the project. Um, that can be anything from slope tracking to cover crop seeding to mulching. Um, working through our, you know, within our environmental inspections, we'll be coordinating with contractors on what BMPs are going to be appropriate to utilize for stabilization measures. Um, sediment control measures, you know, whether you want to call it a silt fence or a sediment basin, silt checks, any of that type of stuff, um, our specs will be requiring that everything is um, cleaned out when they're, when they're half full. So when said basin's half full, it needs to be cleaned out. The silt fence is half full, it needs to be cleaned out as well. So really to boil down the stormwater permit, um, if we're stabilizing as we go, keeping our sediments on our right of way and out of our wetlands and waterway areas, then uh, that's the biggest portion of that pro program. Uh, maintaining, managing any pollutants so that we, if there's any spills that happen on the project, making sure that stuff gets cleaned up as quick as possible. Um, probably one thing to kind of kind of remember is that uh, the construction stormwater permit is Section 402 of the Clean Water Act, and the key word there is water. As our, from my experience, as our regulated regulators that visit our projects, first thing they're doing is looking at waterways and if there's sediment things in the in the stream or wetland, that tends to get a lot of folks very interested and concerned about the project. So making sure that stuff stays clean is high priority. Um, we have a couple new environmental specs. Um, we, we call them either Section 115 and 116 for the Environmental Commitment Compliance and Hazardous Material Management Specifications. Um, these are new specifications. However, they are going into all projects moving forward. Um, so we'll see them on this project as well. Um, basically, what these specifications do is they um, provide the expectations we have for how we're going to manage our environmental commitments on the project. Um, they're going to they're outline what must occur in order to receive our uh, environmental commitment, contractor compliance, lump sum payment. Um, there's essentially three documents that are required to be completed in order to receive that, that payment for that item. Your temporary erosion control plan, your, your spill, spill plan for your hazardous materials that are on site, and, and your migratory bird compliance plan. Um, along with that, you need assigning responsibility for the environmental representatives included within that lump sum item and any any best management practices that are required as a part of any of those documents um, is also in there and doesn't have a pay item associated with it could be included in that in that item in that lump sum payment as well so for instance if you have uh, the spill plan will require that um, we have a spill kit on site so we have materials available to clean up any issues that we have on the project. Um, we don't have a pay item for a spill kit, so you'd have to be factoring that into that lump sum payment for any costs associated with that. Um, the tra training that is required, um, we have two classes um, for, for erosion control training now. Um, the 
erosion sediment control for installers and, and erosion control for inspectors. Um, the installers class is for basically for everybody that's on the project that's going to be installing best management practices. Um, it's a two to three hour online training, no classroom work involved in it, strictly online. Um, for those that would be, for individuals from the contractor side that would be attending any of the environmental inspections, they'd be required to take the ocean sediment control for inspectors course, and that is a day long in person class. Um, all in LTAP, Nebraska LTAP manages those classes for us, both the online and the live, and so information is available at that website for getting enrolled in any of those options. Um, our environmental commitment compliance spec. Um, it's, it's going to just describe any environmental inspections that can occur on the project. Um, as I mentioned, we'll be doing bi-weekly inspections with project staff. Environmental coordinators will be doing inspections. My staff will be doing inspections. Um, any of those inspections have, have the potential to generate corrective actions that would need to be resolved. And our requirement for resolving corrective actions, identify those inspections, is they need to be done within seven days of, of that of receiving notification of that report. Um, if, it's, if the work is completed within that seven days, the corrective actions are done within that time frame, you know, the contractor is eligible for an incentive payment. Um, if it isn't done within that time frame, then the contractor is eligible for a disincentive payment for bay until that, until that stuff is resolved. On a project of this size with our inspections, I can anticipate some highly lengthy lists of issues that could potentially be happening, especially after a major major rain event. So one of the challenges is going to be making sure that there's adequate material available to material, you know, silt fences, blankets, whatever we need available to get that stuff resolved and within that short time frame. And we, you know, we can't be having situations where contractors saying, well, we have, to, we have to wait four to six weeks for a blanket to arrive from the East Coast or something have stuff available quick to get this stuff resolved, especially like I said, we're working with waterways and regulatory agencies looking at our projects, we can't be waiting on materials to show up. Um, hazardous materials management, um, this is section 116 of our specifications <laughs> describes how we manage hazardous materials on our project. Um, important to read our definition of how NDOT defines hazardous materials for project. Basically, we're, we're considering whether it's hazardous or regulated materials all in the one specification. So how you're managing your oils on the project is the same as how we're managing anything else that's considered hazardous. Um, once again, keeping everything out of waterways is, is critical for that. Um, inspector um, puts, puts in definitions as to what needs to be put together within the spill prevention plan. Um, Basically, it's documenting the contractor's procedures for what they're going to be to be preventative to stop, you know, for the heat spills from happening to begin with, and what they're going to be doing, what the processes are for getting stuff cleaned up when things do happen, go wrong, and we do have a leak or spill on the project. The spec and hazard material spec also gets into you know, what, what, we're, what our expectations are for secondary containment, for inspections of your containers, having the spill kits on site, and what to happen. What documentation is required when a, when a release does occur on the project? Um, essentially, any oil product that's over 25 gallons needs to be reported to NDE, and then they will you know, be coordinating with them as far as what, what the cleanup requirements are for that. Spills of less than that quantity, we need to be cleaned up on site and documenting that we've cleaned, cleaned stuff up. So that, that's all I have for last part of environmental.